Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tavrula Kodoe, and I am the immediate past chair of SECED. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to the 17th Mallet Mill Lecture. The work welcome goes out also to those of, us, of you that are joining us uh, remotely through the webcast. Before we start, can I remind you to turn off your mobile phones if you haven't done already? If you hear a fire alarm, it will be the real thing, so you should leave the room as soon as possible following the two fire exits that are indicated at the back of the room. The assembly point is uh, the storage gate, which is, as you go out of the building to your left, the first street that you come across at the corner on the way to St. James Park. Today's lecture and the reception that will follow, it has been kindly sponsored by our gold sponsors, um, Atkins and Rendell, and our silver sponsor, Jacobs. It goes without saying, but we are truly grateful for your support. The Mallet Mill Lecture Series is normally a biennial event, but um, although we had, for obvious reasons, a longer interval this time around, but we are very, very happy and pleased that we've managed to have it as an um, in-person event eventually. The Lecture Series is established by SECED uh, in honour uh, of uh, the pioneering uh, British scientists uh, Robert Mallet and John Milne, uh, and today's lecture, the 17th Mill Lecture, will be delivered by Julian Bomer in recognition for his long-standing contribution to British international earthquake engineering. Julian has had and is still having a distinguished career in earthquake engineering with over 35 years experience in seismic hazard studies for major engineering projects around the world. He started his career as an academic uh, following his PhD studies under the supervision of the late Professor Lee Cambrasis who incidentally was the very first Mallet Mill lecturer. Following the footsteps of Embraces, Julian conducted numerous field studies of uh, damaging earthquakes around the world, just to mention a few of them, Armenia, California, Colombia, El Salvador, uh, Mozambique, just to name a few. He was inspirational as a lecturer and an excellent promoter of uh, earthquake engineering, and I um, have um, personally the privilege of being one of his students, so I can... Uh, <laughs> Uh, actually uh, say that uh, with personal experience. A few years after attaining his uh, professorial chair at Imperial College, he decided to move to full-time consultancy. And there, uh, Julian has worked on uh, hazard and risk assessments for major engineering projects around the world, including dams, bridges, pipelines, notably the expansion of the Panama Canal, as well as, as worked, he has worked as an expert witness on several uh, earthquake-related disputes. A significant portion of Julian's work relates uh, to the nuclear sector, uh, working as an advisor to the Office for uh, Nuclear Regulation in the UK, and as a consultant on projects in Abu Dhabi, Brazil, uh, Romania, Spain, South Africa, Switzerland, and the United States. In more recent years, Julian has worked extensively in the field of induced seismicity, and we'll see quite a few examples of that in the lecture, I suspect, with engagements throughout the world related to the estimation of the hazard and the risk associated with earthquakes caused by anthropogenic activities. The lecture tonight draws on Julia's extensive experience around the world to discuss the key issues, the key challenges in engineering projects, projects of um, identifying, quantifying, and if possible, reducing uh, uncertainties. Uh, the written version of the lecture is an extensive monograph that has been published already by the Bulletin of Earthquake Engineering uh, as a separate volume in open access. And as you will have noticed, it's also available for purchase, the hard copy of uh, the volume uh, just outside um, the room. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to a thought-provoking lecture tonight. And without further delay, I would like to invite Julian to deliver the 17th Mallet Mill Lecture. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Savrula. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I will dive straight in, because I have quite a lot to try and cover. So there is a paper. Uh, it's 245 pages long. I can't possibly summarize it in this evening's lecture. So what I'm going to do is try to give you a few amuse-bouche, as I would say, to whet your appetite in the hope that you will uh, read the paper. There's a very long acknowledgment section at the end of the paper, so I won't go through those now. But I do obviously want to say thank you to Seked, and particularly to the committee and to Savrula for the honor of uh, being invited to give this lecture and also to reiterate our great thanks to the three companies who very kindly sponsored the event. And I also, of course, want to thank all of you for taking the time out to be here in the Thomas Telford Lecture Theatre or to be joining us online. 
So having said I'm going to give you an amuse bouche, I'm going to organize the lecture in the form of a menu. And your starter, which is a large salad in effect, is all about hazard and risk due to natural earthquakes. Ultimately, what we're doing in earthquake engineering is trying to reduce or mitigate earthquake risk, which, as I'm sure you all know, is a convolution of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. Exposure means what we build, what's there, the infrastructure that exists in seismic active areas. Seismic hazard assessment is the work of engineering seismologists to quantify the demand that would be placed by earthquakes on our buildings, whereas vulnerability is the work of earthquake engineers to reduce the vulnerability by providing greater capacity. Provided the capacity is greater than the demand, buildings will behave well. When that's not the case, disaster ensues. That's not to say, however, therefore, <coughs> that earthquake safety depends exclusively and entirely on getting exactly the right estimates of hazard, because there's always safety margins put in uh, engineering design. We've seen this in several nuclear facilities. In 2007, a large earthquake offshore of the western coast of Japan struck the largest nuclear power plant in the world, seven functioning reactors. And in every single one of those reactors, ground motions were recorded that exceeded the design basis of, of the reactor facility. But in none of the cases was there anywhere close to ra radiation leakage because of the defense in depth and the multiple layers of protection. The same was seen in North Anna in Virginia and also in the Tohoku earthquake in the Fukushima uh, and other nuclear power plants. Prior to the tsunami, there was absolutely no threatening damage whatsoever. Having said that, it does help us to be able to design risk mitigation measures based on robust estimates of possible hazard levels, because then we can balance resources with the investment in the mitigation. So although we don't rely 100% on the exactly correct hazard estimate, there's no such thing, we do want to make a realistic estimate. So what does seismic hazard analysis involve? First question is, where will future earthquakes occur? And similarly, we need to know what size will these earthquakes be? In other words, what will the magnitude of the earthquakes will be? And the answer to both those questions ultimately lies in the presence of geological faults. All earthquakes occur on faults, whether they were previously identified or not. So finding faults, which is usually much easier after the earthquakes than before, and, and, see, and ma mapping their length, their offset, etc., from earlier events is vital information to tell us where earthquakes are likely to be located in the future. <clears throat> and the size of the earthquake can also be estimated from the dimensions of fault ruptures because there's a direct and exponential correlation between the dimensions of fault ruptures and the magnitude of the earthquake. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about finding faults in practice. And the first one is from the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, the only operating uh, nuclear power plant in coastal California, in, cent in the center of the state, in a very uh, beautiful location. It was originally um, designed, there are a lot of active uh, faults in the region, so DCP is here in the middle, and you have this large structure here called the Hoskri Fault. And the event was originally designed uh, sorry, the nuclear power plant was designed against a magnitude 7.2 earthquake occurring on that fault just seven and, uh, four and a half kilometers away from the plant. The plant already had a pretty des onerous design basis with a 0.75G PGA. But one of the conditions of the license that the US NRC gave to that plant was they had to continuously update and improve the hazard assessment and the, the safety assessment. So that led to a great deal of um, research funded by the company, but a lot of it executed by the USGS and others. And one of the things was to relook at the catalog. And that's the USGS catalog for Central California, earthquake epicenters from routine calculations. And then work was uh, funded to um, make re-evaluation of this using a much more locally accurate velocity model and using joint location of the events. And I was actually in Norm Abrahamson's office, who was at pg e at the time, when one of the other seismologists walked into his office and showed us these results that just come out. And they found the alignment of these, when they relocated the earthquakes, they made a very uh, concerning alignment along the shoreline. And it turned out that they were, they were actually aligned with a fault. Fault plane solutions also were consistent. And they revealed, this is unusual that faults events are sufficiently well located to do this, but they revealed the presence of a fault. <clears throat> so now you have not just the Hoskri fault four and a half kilometers away, but the shoreline fault barely 400, sorry, 600, less than about half a kilometer uh, from the plant. And the fear was that you could have an event 
beginning on the Hosgrey Fault and propagating down, but deciding to branch off onto the, Hos onto the shoreline fault, giving you a magnitude seven plus event barely half a kilometer away from the plant. So that's the kind of scenario that then had to be investigated. This was all investigated thoroughly. The plant was found to have the capacity for what additional hazard would be represented by the plant. But what was interesting question really came out was why was the fault, shoreline fault not discovered previously after all the work that had been done to investigate the geology and seismology of that part of California? One of the answers is that the fault lies in the surf zone, which is a difficult area to investigate. Ships can't get in there. You can neither use onshore nor very effectively uh, offshore invest geophysics. But the real reason that it hadn't been discovered previously and was confirmed uh, in the 2000s was because of the fantastic increase in what we can measure geophysically. So here's the offshore bathymetry as measured in 1989. And you can see the plant there, and you can't really see anything that would stand out as a fault. When this work was redone following the location of those epicenters, it's screamingly obvious that there's a structure there now very, very well um, exposed. So, okay, moving on. So we've got two questions about what hazard analysis is, and it's about finding faults. More fault stories will come up. Um, the next question has to be answered is how frequently will such earthquakes occur? So just finding a geological structure in the ground that you could classify as a fault isn't really enough to make it a source of future earthquakes. You need to have evidence that that fault has actually moved in geologically recent times, how much it's moved and how frequently it's moved. So we need to find exposures or create exposures of these faults and then identify the offset uh, strata and accurately date those strata, the younger strata that have been moved, in order to get a date on the last movement. Usually we'd expect an earthquake to have moved in the quaternary if, if we're going to consider it to be active. <clears throat> so a story about dating. There's a, this is in central Spain, Aragon, and it's the story of the Concoud Fault. So in a small town here, Teruel, the Aragon government announced in 2012 the project to build a new hospital for this uh, small town or city. And that project began. Um, the, pro the location is in the lowest seismic hazard part of Spain on the National uh, Seismic Building Code. So it was declared as not requiring, according to the code, it does not need seismic design. But when the project was well advanced, a paper was published that um, characterized the Concoud for, which passes within about 400 meters of the hospital site. And that study had estimated that this fault was slipping at a rate of 0.53 millimeters a year. Now that's not Californian kind of rates, but it's enough to make this a potential source of serious earthquakes. This made it a risk. And that put the hospital construction project on hold while it, the design was modified to deal with the ground motions that might come from that fault. A few years ago, we had a project to reassess the seismic hazard at all nuclear power plant stations in Spain. And as part of that work, all the faults in any proximity to the power plants were reinvestigated. And what came out through that work was that all of the aging that had been uh, chrono geochronology that had been done by the lab that gave the young ages for those displacements on the Concord Fault were found to be systematically very... Um, bias to young ages. They were underestimating the age of deposits by factors of three to five. So in fact, the, 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 there were displacements on those faults, but so you've got the old ages on the y x-axis and the new ages done by other laboratories on the y-axis, you can see that the, the faults, well, the, move, the displaced deposits were much older and therefore the fault movements were much older. And in fact, this fault is far, far less active than the paper had claimed. The hospital project eventually got back on course with a nominal uh, PGA was agreed, of something quite low, but to account for possible hazard. But it, this is a story of a, of a very needed public resource being delayed by several years because of some rather poorly done um, aging work on a, on a particular fault and a paper being published based on the poorly determined uh, dates. Another interesting story of faults, possibly the most interesting, is the Pedro Miguel fault, which was discovered uh, in relation to the Panama Canal. So in the early 2000s, a project began to build the new locks on the, for the, on the Panama Canal to accommodate the post-Panamax ships, much larger container ships. 
And for that work, the Panama Canal Authority established the seismic, a seismic advisory, advisory board to look at earthquake, earthquake hazard in Panama and advise on studies that should be done and ultimately what seismic design should be considered for the new locks and dams. I was privileged to be on that uh, advisory board. Seismic hazard estimates at the time when our board was formed were entirely based on two offshore structures, sort of incipient there's an incipient subduction zone to the north of Panama. There's a former subduction zone to the south, both of which, which is now working as a transform fault. But no real structures exist inside. So you have a decay of the seismic hazard. That's the approximate location of the canal. A decay of the hazard away from those structures and rather low accelerations in central Panama where the canal is. But we recommended that some work be done by uh, geologists because if you look at a surface elevation map of central Panama, there are some very straight lines in the topography and straight lines are usually indicative of faults. And here you can see another way of showing central Panama. And you, if you cut a line through here, you can actually realign all the topography by displacing that fault back to where it would have been a few thousand years ago. It all lines up uh, very nicely. That's called uh, the Gatun Fall, and that was the first one that was investigated. So some very extensive geological work was done with multiple trenches, uh, aging uh, techniques. You can see one of the, example, the trenches here mapped out. The samples were very carefully aged, and a number of active faults. The Gatun was not the only one <coughs> that was identified. The most important is this one, the Pedro Miguel Fall. It was identified as having caused in the geological past at several earthquakes of about magnitude 7, the most recent of which that the aging dates indicated probably occurred in the last 500 years. And that's important because it's very close to the Pacific locks, the existing and the new Pacific locks. In fact, it goes through one of the dams of the new Pacific access channel. And also, Panama City is just here a few kilometers away. So, a great deal of work went into investigating the Pedro Miguel Fault to investigate it. Here's one of the three-dimensional trenches that were built up. That's the approximate trace of where the fault runs through that particular site. What you need to look at at the back, in the distance, barely four kilometers away, is Panama City. The skyline of which today looks like this. It's kind of like a Dubai. Um, and a lot of soft stories on those structures. So there was concern both for the canal, and there's possibly even bigger concern for what this might mean for Panama City. <clears throat> a piece of evidence was subsequently found, which is possibly the most compelling uh, paleoseismological evidence that I've ever, or anyone has ever seen. So you had, during the Spanish colonial times, uh, this kind of um, cobblestone road that crossed the isthmus, so the gold being taken from Mexico and Peru was brought up to here, transported by donkey along this path and then onto the Chagres River to ships here which would bring it back to Spain. It's known when that Camino de Cruces, as it was called, road was built in about 1533. It's also known that it was abandoned around 1855 because a railway was constructed parallel to it. So having already found the fall and identified it from the trenches and determined that there was probably an earthquake in the last 500 years, the geologists and I was lucky to go with them. When we went into kind of three hour trek through the jungle to where this road is, and there's remnants of the, Cam the Camino here. You can see the cobblestone here. That's incidentally Lloyd Clough, who was another Mallet Mill lecturer. And, what we, and you can see here where the fort crosses the road. And what we found is that it lines up perfectly with what was seen in all the trenches and all the geological mapping, that there's a f the fort runs through there, and this is the path of the, of the Camino offset by exactly how much had been predicted by the trenches. We know from historical accounts there was an earthquake in 1621 in Panama, which destroyed the old city located further off um, to the east. And it seems fairly conclusive, therefore, that that earthquake was actually on the Pedro Miguel Four, giving us a very recent event on the fault and giving it a um, very significant level of activity, that it can generate magnitude seven earthquakes every few hundred years, which is a completely different picture from how seismic hazard in Panama had been uh, perceived before then. So that determined the final design loads for the, um, the new features of the Panama Canal. Some of the consortia 
withdrew at that point because they didn't feel they could design the locks to handle that kind of accelerations up at the 1G level. It also finally got embedded in the seismic design code. That's the current building code for Panama. This is the acceleration map, and it very, very closely maps uh, those faults. However, despite that compelling information, there's been quite strong resistance amongst some engineers and others in Panama to this new information. In fact, I was there two weeks ago in meetings about the new metro, and there were engineers there who would like to see these faults um, disappear, so to speak, that they, they challenge the information on which they're based. And it's partly understandable if you go back in history. When I was there on earlier trips for the canal work, this was in my hotel room, sort of why you should come and live in Panama. <clears throat> and one of the things it has on the opening page is a sort of quick summary of all the great things about living in Panama. And the one that caught my eye was this one. Panama has no hurricanes or major earthquakes. <laughs> Whoever wrote that probably genuinely believes this. It hasn't had an earthquake for 400 years, but it does have strong um, earthquakes. If you look at the map of recent, this is a 20th century seismicity in Central America, it's very well known that there's active volcanoes and earthquakes all along the isthmus. Until you get to Panama, then the earthquakes kind of go out to shore and die off. The instrumental seismicity record doesn't indicate high seismicity. <clears throat> but that is a very short insight to the long-term geological patterns. In fact, the reason that pa Panama was chosen over Nicaragua, which was the alternative route at the time, when the US Senate voted on which route to back, on the morning of the vote, all the senators were sent a uh, postca postcard with a stamp from Nicaragua showing active volcanoes and the risk of volcanoes and earthquakes there persuaded them that it was Panama was a safer option. So it's kind of in the birth of Panama and the canal was this concept of not being seismically active. It is seismically active, it's just long-term uh, maximum magnitude style earthquakes on these active faults, which will produce earthquakes again in the future. Okay, my last question that we try to answer in seismic hazard analysis is having defined where the earthquakes will occur, how big the earthquakes will be and how frequently they'll occur, what level of ground shaking are we going to get? Ultimately, we design our buildings to resist ground shaking. We know all about shaking from looking at recordings of accelerations of the ground. We characterize it with parameters like PGA. We can integrate the acceleration and get uh, parameters like the peak ground velocity, PGV. So we also obviously use response spectra. And what we're trying to do is develop models that for each of those earthquakes we consider, we need to get an estimate of the ground motion. So we develop equations like these, which predict the level of acceleration, or sorry, of velocity in this case, against distance for different magnitudes as a function of different uh, types of site condition and different types of earthquake fault mechanism. And they're very straightforward, and their application of these models is fairly um, straightforward also. But they're slightly deceptive, because we plot them like this, and it makes it look as if their exact values are known for each magnitude, distance, soil, and uh, mechanism combination. In reality, the data we derive these from show enormous scatter. So these are the recordings from a single earthquake in California, all on soil sites. And that's the prediction, like the one I just showed you, of the acceleration through that was used in California at the time. And you can see it's a roughly fits the data, but there's an enormous scatter around the data. So we have to look at the residuals, the difference between the observations and what we predict. And we find that these residuals, fortunately, when we do everything in log space, approximate very well to a nor standard normal distribution. So we can characterize that by the standard deviation of that distribution and sigma. But it means that we're not no longer predicting single values, we're predicting a distribution, a probabilistic distribution of possible ground motion levels. So our equations are gonna be a function of magnitude, style of faulting, distance, site conditions, plus epsilon sigma, how many standard deviations above or below the median do we want our predictions to be, are we considering? It's part of the prediction. It's not something we can choose or not to add on. It's that whole distribution that's being predicted in our equations. And we get very different levels of motion, which with different probabilities of occurring, depending on how many standard deviations we exist. And that's important because in a probabilistic seismic hazard assessment, you have to include that distribution. The sigma is an integral part of uh, hazard calculations, which is relevant to this story, because now we're getting into whether people accept what comes out of hazard study. So there was a very complicated, expensive project run in Switzerland. Um, 
called the Pegasus Project, which was done for four nuclear power plants simultaneously back in the early 200s. Um, when the results came out, they were rejected by the utilities. The, the owners of the plants said they wouldn't accept the study, and they said that the method used was unnecessarily complex and that it had artificially inflated the level of acceleration at the sites. Papers were published in journals sympathetic to deterministic methods with their editors, but this chap in particular went on a crusade to discredit the project and to have the results uh, thrown out. And it caused quite a commotion. It means the study was in abeyance for quite some time. Nothing was done with the results because of the controversy generated. The real issue was the fact that the hazard estimates which came out of this study, the Pegasus Project, were substantially higher than what they had designed for originally in the 1980s. So here's seismic hazard curves, probability of exceedance, peak ground acceleration. That's what they had in the early 1980s from a probabilistic seismic hazard assessment for a PRA, and that's what the Pegasus project came up with. So the kind of return period we're interested in, 10 to the minus 4, it was a substantial, about a two and a half times increase of the acceleration. So you can understand why there was some consternation. But what was interesting is we went back and looked at the original study that they'd done in the 1980s, and inferring what could be inferred from the documentation, the only way to reproduce their hazard results was to completely ignore the dispersion in the ground motion equations. You would have to pretend there was no sigma and run the hazard calculations with, no, with, with epsilon always at zero to be able to get the same results. If you then repeated the calculations using a reasonable value of sigma, what you actually find is that the hazard results, at the, at the median from the logic tree at least, was at least as high as what came out of Pegasus. So Pegasus didn't create the result. If we look at median, sorry, mean hazard rather than median, there was an additional contribution from the way Pegasus was done. But the real problem here was that the original hazard results were basically incorrect. And when they were corrected, they were in the same ballpark. So all that delay happened on the basis of trying to defend indefensible results. And this is a kind of a theme of, I'm going to, of the lecture and the paper is about getting the results accepted. So how can we increase the likelihood that when hazard estimates that come out of our studies will be accepted? Well, one is we should have clarity about who needs to do the accepting. And I would argue that hazard results ultimately need to be accepted by regulatory authorities. It's not really up to owners. It's great if they can be a, come along and if the public can also be persuaded, but ultimately it has to reside with regulators, a theme I'll come back to. We also need to sh ensure that the hazard calculations are performed correctly. In the past, as the practice of PSHA was developing, there were reasons why mistakes could be made. I would say there's really no excuse for doing otherwise. Something that people have always said is there isn't a good textbook on how to do PSHA. Well, there is now, and you should all have one. And if you've got it, you can't make incorrect hazard calculations. Um, it's also really important to compile all the existing data and as far as possible, especially about in terms of site conditions, collect your new data so that you can, we can constrain our models as well as possible, the inputs to the hazard calculations. But what cannot be constrained should be reflected. We have to have methods to identify, quantify, and incorporate the uncertainty that still exists after we've um, used whatever data is available. So that means that we'll have hazard estimates that do really reflect the features of the seismic hazard, seismic source and ground motion models that can't be constrained by data set. In other words, the limit, recognize the limits of our current state of knowledge. So examples of where this has been done well, we did a study a few years ago for a new build nuclear site in South Africa where there are a number of faults. These were studied in great depth, very careful dating was done of the rocks in multiple different methodologies. There were marine terraces identified all over the coastline, which the faults generally crossed. And these marine terraces are, can be well dated because they co correspond to specific sea levels in different times, uh, which, are, which are well known globally. And the absence of any displacement on those marine terraces, in some in several cases, provided evidence that these, are, that these faults have moved very little in geologically recent times, if at all. So they, probability, quite low probabilities, sometimes as low as zero, were assigned to some of the faults. 
And additionally, there was a great deal of work done on historical seismicity, so a historical, uh, his, a historical seismologist or seismological historian went and looked at every location around the site in the region, what newspapers had been in publication and which government records had been kept, and found that they, those that reported events like floods and storms, etc. So when you have a clear record that natural events and destructive events are being reported and earthquakes are not included in those events, you go from an absence of evidence to evidence for absence of these events. And that painstaking work <laughs> confirmed that for the last two to three hundred years, that region where the site is located is genuinely of low seismicity. It's not just that we don't have records, they're, they're, there's evidence that there have not been earthquakes there and the faults are of low activity and it resulted in the site having low activity. Elsewhere, we've had to take a different approach. So for the nuclear power plant in Brazil, it's about 100 kilometers south of Rio, a very beautiful location. Um, there is evidence that's been published by Brazilian geologists of there being faults and they're exposed in, in quarry cuttings and in, and in road cuttings and there's evidence for displacement of different geological formations. The problem is that there isn't reliable dating information and it hasn't been possible for some of these to find persistent evidence of these displacements across the landscape or evidence in the landscape for repeated large movements on these faults. So we had a con conundrum, what do we do? We, we've got indication that these might be some of these might be active faults but we don't have conclusive evidence, we don't have time or budget to do the kind of study that was done elsewhere either. So in this case, what we did is define an additional polygon within which we said we'll take these faults, we'll only consider the large earthquakes that occur on them, the largest, we'll take a sort of characteristical maximum magnitude approach, we'll assign slip rates, the maximum slip rate that these faults could be having without manifesting more clearly in the landscape, and effectively generate a catalogue of large earthquakes that would come exclusively from the faults rather than from the observed seismicity. And we added that into something called our logic tree, I'll talk about in just a second. So you see here we added this equivalent fault zone with only a 10% probability that these faults actually were active. But because they contribute infrequent but large earthquakes, when we added them in, we went from these are uh, uniform hazard response spectra at different annual frequency of exceedance, so that's a short return period, that's 100,000 years. So the dashed lines are before we added that source in and the solid line is the effect. So as you go in short return periods, it makes no difference because these earthquakes have long recurrence intervals. But when you go to long return periods, then those faults started to add a significant contribution. And without evidence to dismiss the seismogenic capacity, that seemed like a defensible approach. So these logic trees, what they are is simply a structure for organizing our understanding of uncertainty. So we put a node for every input that has uncertainty, and we have branches on the nodes that reflect different potential choices to which we assign weights that reflect how likely they may or may not be. This is a very simple logic tree, but what we then do is we follow through every path on the logic tree, every branch combination. It'll have a weight associated with it, which is the product of the weights along those branches, and then we'll repeat the hazard calculation for all of them, and we then have to do statistics. We no longer have a single hazard curve, but we get the statistics of our hazard like this. What we'll normally use is the mean hazard, which is the red curve here. But now we get two decisions to make. The first is how far we want to come down this axis, which is how safe we want to be. For, for normal dwellings, that's usually 500-year return period. For more important facilities, LNG plants, for example, it might be 2,500. For nuclear power plants, it's more likely to be 10,000. And as we go down, you can see the spread increases. And how far across we go, which of those curves we use, tell, is related to how, the level of confidence we want to have that we're reaching the target um, hazard level. So to populate a logic tree, we're talking about epistemic uncertainty, which is essentially lack of knowledge, so that we can't go out and measure things to tell us what should go on the logic tree. We have to inevitably use expert judgment, which engineers are quite comfortable with anyhow. <clears throat> but however, it's not just a question of having an expert judgment. We need to organize. It's, it's going to, we're going to have a more robust answer in most cases if we have multiple experts making a judgment and interacting with each other and being challenged on their judgments. So guidelines have been written 
mostly for the nuclear facility, for, uh, nuclear industry, but they can be adapted elsewhere, the so-called SHAC procedure. And there's a guidelines which were produced in 2012, 2018. I was part of the writing team for these. And these give very clear guidance on how we need to organize multiple ha uh, expert hazard assessments so that we can combine these expert judgments in a constructive um, way. What I want to briefly talk about to end this first part of the lecture is that now we've got the procedures, what we've also done, which is possibly even more exciting in the last few years, is develop ways of visualizing the epistemic uncertainty. We've got technical, te technical developments that give us greater insight or ability to, to view that we're capturing the correct um, distribution. One of these is what we call the backbone GMP approach. So GMP is ground motion prediction equation. For many, many years, the standard way the logic tree was constructed was simply to select equations that might be appropriate and give them weights according to how appropriate, how each relative, relative sort of confidence in each one being the right model. The problem with doing that is you're giving weights to models, but what you actually want is a distribution of what the output of the models. And it's an opaque relationship between the two. So then when we start plotting the models up, and these are, has, these are models that were used in a hazard study in North America for quite important infrastructure. And when you plot the three equations up that they use, there are several locations where the three converge to the same value. It's just an artifact of these particular equations. But what it says, in effect, is there's no uncertainty in the ground motion for that magnitude and distance combination. It's not true. It's just a product of using these equations. So what we proposed to do instead in a backbone approach was to take a single model selected on the basis of number of criteria and then to adjust it to the local conditions rather than make any weighting about how like applicable it may or may not be, make it applicable by putting uncertainty on each of those adjustments. So we might take a backbone uh, ground motion model, we might make an adjustment for the, what, the stress drop in the target region is how explosive, let's say, the ruptures, earthquakes are, whether the geometric spreading is the same or different from the host region, and also whether the inherent uh, attenuation is different. But if we concatenate these conversions to the models, what we end up with is a distribution of models from our backbone. These are predictions now plotted against magnitude rather than against distance of accelerations. And we end up with these, we don't have these overlapping or pinching points where we appear to have no uncertainty. We capture the correct and full <clears throat> distribution. Also very important development is in terms of site effects. In ground motion prediction models, site effects are normally captured by the use of a parameter called VS30. It's just the average shear wave velocity on the top 30 meters. It's a useful parameter for standard applications, but at site-specific applications, it's not very good. This is from work by one of my our, in fact, Saru and I, PhD students. Um, you have two profiles here with very different velocity structures, but they happen to have almost identical VS30 values. So the GMP will tell you they have the same output, but if you look at their the site amplification factors, they're quite different in both amplitude and the frequency. So for anything that's a site-specific critical hazard assessment, we'll do always hazard in the rock, in some rock reference, rock horizon, and then conduct site response analysis. But we also need to capture uncertainty in the site response, as well as just as we do in the rock motions. The standard way of doing this is to have multiple uh, velocity profiles that we put into the site response model. We'll have a best estimate from the measurements, but some estimate of the standard deviation, how different they could be. And then we'll give weights to those VS profiles. And that's very similar to putting weights on GMPEs. Again, we're putting weights on models, but what we're interested in is the output from the model. <clears throat> and when you do that, you put weights on models, you can get the same unintended effect of your amplification factors all coalescing at some frequencies to tell you there's no epistemic uncertainty, that we have exactly the same value. It's not true. Again, it's an artifact. So we developed, if you like, a backbone approach for doing site amplification effects, which ensures that we always have the complete distribution in our amplification factors. So I think we're getting much better at doing seismic hazard assessment that does include uncertainty and using very good data and good measurements, which should give us more reassurance. But can we get to a point where the assessments that, are going to, that come out can be also assessed or accepted objectively by others? <clears throat> I believe that robust hazard estimates best on the available data and 
including all the unavailable uh, uncertainties, should be the starting point for any decision making about risk mitigation. But we've already seen in the, what happened in Panama and the Pegasus project that people's preconceptions about what the hazard is will obviously, will, can obviously can often be a big obstacle to overcome. And I'll finish this uh, starter, it's a long starter, but it is the starter, with um, talking about something that happened in Italy. There were two earthquakes in the early 200s in Italy, which occurred in zones which on the hazard map, in the seismic study map, the, the, let's say the source zone map behind the, the mapping, occurred in areas that had been declared a seismic. And one of these was very tragic. The Molise earthquake caused the collapse of a school. It killed 25 children in that school. So there was a big project launched to reassess the, the seismic hazard and then reassess, uh, devise a new seismic design code to look at seismic safety of schools. Damien Grant and I worked on that together. Um, but the first part was the hazard map. And the INGV, which is the sort of Geological Survey of Italy, produced a hazard map after several years. I was a reviewer for this project and published the map. And there it is. Red is the high zone, green is the lowest zone, so you go from one down to four, and that's the hazard map. But being Italy, the law requires that the provinces or the regions, these geographical areas, are, must have some influence. So the map is published, but the regions have the right to change any municipality one by one up to one class. You've got four hazard classes, and the regions, without giving any justification, could make an, a, could just declare a change of um, the hazard. Unsurprisingly, almost 70 municipalities um, decided to go down to a slightly lower hazard. Okay, that was you know, asking for that to happen. But about 10 minutes to midnight on the last day that you could make these changes, another set of changes was submitted where four municipalities in Basilicata went up from zone three to Y2, zone two. Why would you do that? So here's the region. And those are the four zones, which just before anyone could dispute it, were pulled up from yellow to brown, from zone two, zone three to zone one. The reason that was done is that one of those zones, number three, is Scanzano Gianico, which had been selected as the national site for a nuclear waste repository. And the legislation for that project to go ahead declared that the repository could not be built in anywhere that was classified as zone one or zone two. And with that, they killed the project. Excuse me. So that brings us to our main course, which is hazard and risk due to induced earthquakes. Induced earthquakes are earthquakes whose time and location of occurrence are related to industrial anthropogenic activities that change the stress state, particularly the pressure on fluids inside the earth. In reality, what we call induced earthquakes are mostly triggered earthquakes. It means that they're incipient, that the stress that's being released was there from tectonic processes, and the small change made by the anthropogenic activity just releases them, brings them on in time. But we use the word induced to cover the whole lot. It's an accepted terminology. Obje if objective assessment of natural seismic hazard is challenging, obviously it's going to be even more challenging to do it for induced earthquakes. One reason being that induced earthquakes are viewed as an imposed rather than an involuntary or natural risk. And they're often produced by activities like fracking, but not by no means only fracking, which are already in themselves controversial processes. However, I believe that any debate about this should at least start with objective assessments of the hazard and risk as a starting point. There will obviously be multiple factors to be considered, but those factors should, should start by considering the real risk rather than influencing our assessment of the risk. It's a subtle but important difference. And the very first thing we have to do is make sure that we identify genuinely induced earthquakes and distinguish them from genuinely natural earthquakes. So are all earthquakes that occur in regions of hydrocarbon production induced? In some cases, it's unambiguous that they are. In recent years, I've worked in two oil fields down here in Colombia. All earthquake activity in Colombia happens uh, to the west in these mountain belts. This area of the country is largely a seismic. They started massive wastewater injection. It's comparable to what's happening in the entire state of Oklahoma in one field. And as they started doing that, uh, seismicity began, and the two have been been very nicely correlated ever since. So it's unambiguous. These are induced or triggered earthquakes. Elsewhere, it's much less clear. 
back to Italy, May 2012, a series of damage earthquakes occurred in the Emilia-Romagna uh, region. The first earthquake, there was sort of not a classic after foreshock and aftershock, but a series of large earthquakes of similar magnitude with lots of small seismicity in between. But the first large earthquake actually occurred 18 kilometers away from the oil field, and it was the subsequent shocks which occurred closer to the oil field. Studies have been published which show that there's ample precedent for previous seismicity um, in, in this part of Italy and showing that the oil field activities very likely had nothing to do with why the earthquakes occurred. In fact, studies showed that there's, uh, the first earthquake occurs here. So this is a change in stress around the fault. Everything goes blue, it's cooled down because you've released the stress in the earthquake, but then it transfers stress out to the adjacent areas. And so the, the fault that the earthquakes that did occur close to the oil fields were happened there because of the stress transfer from the first earthquake, not because of anything happening in the oil field. Nonetheless, for reasons that are never become fully clear, a panel of experts was assembled to investigate the possible relationship between the earthquakes and the activities in the oil field. The name given to that panel originally was International Commission on Hydrocarbon Exploration Seismicity Increase in Emilia. They subsequently dropped the increase because it was a bit, sounded like the answer was already in the question. <laughs> but nonetheless, they published a report where they concluded that it could not be disproved that there was a correlation between the oil activities and the earthquakes, which led to the region prohibiting any further um, oil-related drilling. So despite and several papers um, arguing in, public, in good journals, peer-reviewed studies being arguing the opposite. Equally important as distinguishing between natural and induced earthquakes is when we have induced earthquakes, we have to know the right cause of those earthquakes. So this takes us to a case um, in Canada and Alberta, a dam, Brazo Dam, where <clears throat> the energy authority, energy regulator, had already established the dams along here, the, the reservoir, exclusion zones, two exclusion zones. So you could do no fracking at all within three kilometers of the dam, and you could do no fracking at all in the deeper Duvernay formation within five kilometers of the dam. It's well recognized that the deeper formations are susceptible to fracking, and therefore they had more um, onerous exclusion criteria. Consultants to the dam, wanting to show that this was, the risk was too high of obeying this ordinance, looked at 10, hydro, about 10,000 hydraulic fracturing wells in the region in the same shallow Cretaceous formations that were to be targeted in the applications and said that a number of them were associated, although uh, had caused induced seismicity, which was enough to raise a red flag. And they did this by an analysis which gave weights to each earthquake and hydraulic fracturing well based on time and separation. So they had two weighting functions based on distance from the well, time after um, injections. You've got the two weights and took their average, which that should be divided by two, what's on the left-hand side. But if you're greater than or equal to 0.35, then that was assumed to be an association. And some very unlikely combinations could do that. You could have an earthquake 20 kilometers away from a well uh, almost 10 days later and say that that was caused by the well. In other cases, you could have an earthquake within four and a half kilometers of the well happening 90 days later and still say it was induced. These don't really match what we understand about the induce, uh, inducing um, earthquakes through uh, injection. James Verdon and myself looked through this data and we first applied the method because they didn't publish originally the list of events they, but we found all these associated events and went through them one by one. Here's one of the examples, there's the earthquake, here's the fracking wells that it was meant to be caused by, and look, right next to it, a massive uh, collection of wastewater injection wells. And in every single case, doing it systematically, looking for what's the most likely cause, every single one was found to be due to either uh, wastewater disposal, deep fracking in the Duvernay formation, and in one case it was actually a natural earthquake. So we, we don't help the science move forward if we, if we assign induced earthquakes to the wrong processes. Okay, but let's say we know what our induced earthquakes are. What we really want to do is make sure we mitigate the risk that they may um, bring. <clears throat> so go back to my un 
very oversimplified equation, but we say seismic risk, in this case hazard, exposure, and I separate vulnerability here into the fragility of the building and the consequences the damage to the building could have on the occupants. In earthquake engineering for natural seismicity, what we generally do is we've decided we're going to create some exposure. We estimate the hazard, we quantify the hazard, the engineering seismology work, and then we use that to make sure that we design the buildings, we reduce their fragility to bring the risk to an acceptable level. Because induced seismicity is caused by process, as anthropogenic processes, what we generally do is the exact opposite. We start, whether it's implicit or, or, or generic or site-specific, but we, talk, we, we have some notion of what could um, the exposure and fragility might be, and we quantify that. We quantify what kind of earthquake could the existing exposure withstand, and we use that to determine what the hazard level shouldn't exceed. So we invert the whole process. I think we miss something in doing that because I think we should use both approaches. But this traditional approach that's been adopted for, for induced seismicity, which is the most appropriate way in some cases, is achieved through something called traffic light systems. So a traffic light system is basically sets up that on, based on levels of ground motion or magnitudes of earthquakes, operational responses. So if you're not producing seismicity or it's at a particularly low level, you're in green, you carry on. If there's signs of the seismicity increasing, you go into red or orange, and you start taking measures to reduce the activity, less volume, less uh, pressure, and if you pass a certain level, you interrupt and stop the pumping and possibly even uh, pump backwards. The objective is to avoid induced earthquakes that could cause damage to exposed buildings or infrastructure. It assumes that the induced sequence will include smaller events prior to the occurrence of potentially damaging events. You, that's an re absolute requirement that you have to, there have to be smaller earthquakes before the ones you're trying to avoid so that you can start implementing the responses. It also, the effectiveness of a traffic light system or scheme depends on whether the crust will respond to changes in the operation. So it's, if you're, for example, extracting gas, it's not a fast response. If you're injecting high pressure liquids, then you, it's likely that if you suddenly re reduce the pressure uh, or even stop the injections, that there's likely to be a response over a shortage period of time. So both of those criteria are essential to operating traffic lights. The first documented traffic light I was part of a team which developed it for a geothermal project in El Salvador. It was a joint project between the local geothermal company and Shell in a sparsely but not uninhabited uh, area of the world. It's an existing geothermal field, but a well that was no longer producing it had effectively become dry. This is technology to inject high pressure water, re stimulate fractures, and, and start producing from hot, dry rock. So we developed a, a Traffic light scheme, it was actually done in terms of PGV levels that could cause damage to buildings, but we converted the PGVs to magnitude because it's quicker and easier to implement on a real-time basis. So we assumed all the earthquakes would occur at the depth of the drilling, and we assumed PGA, PGV at the epicenter directly above. And we also, these defined our green, amber, and red zones, and we also set the benchmark for green to be based on the observed natural seismicity of the region. So we set it, the scheme off, uh, the drilling began, seismicity did occur. The seismicity that occurred immediately around the injection well actually correlated beautifully with the injection. So on this curve, you have in different units, the solid line is the total volume of pumped water in different stages, and the dashed line is the total seismic moment released by those earthquakes. The correlation was beautiful. But in one of those resting periods, an earthquake a little f distance away, magnitude 4.4 occurred and um, was recorded. The ground motions, I'll show you those a bit later. But it occurred in between the injection phases. And that's a problem that we've seen very often, these so-called trailing events, that very often in injection-related projects, the largest events occur when you're not actually pumping. And it does raise the question, well, if a traffic light is to tell you to stop pumping when earthquakes start to occur, but the biggest event happens when you're not pumping, does that make, um, can the traffic light system be of any use? I did kind of at one time concluded perhaps not, uh, 
but I was persuaded by, uh, again, James Verdon, who's here this evening, so we looked at this together in the context of that project that I spoke about a moment ago and analysed 35 case histories of traffic light systems for hydraulic fracturing, Canada, UK, UK and the US. And James came up with, I think, a very nice title for that paper. And what we did is look at the statistics of these magnitude jumps. So in sequences of induced seismic uh, hydraulic fracturing, what were the biggest jumps in magnitude that occurred during the sequence? And what were the increase in magnitude of the trailing events, the one that occurred post-operation. And our argument is you could now, knowing this, you can make informed decisions that you should take those jumps into account in the design of your traffic light. They should influence the design of your yellow and red traffic light levels should accommodate the fact that you may have these increases, uh, either a jump during the sequence or an increase afterwards. Happily, the case history showed there were no cases of large jumps and large increases in trailing events. So you don't need to consider both but you, together, but they should both be considered. So we can now design traffic lights that take the statistics of these observations and accommodate the fact that we may have a trailing event and how much more increase of magnitude we may have. So we can make our traffic lights um, effective again. These are typical thresholds that have been used for um, around the world for injection of <coughs> activities in Canada and the US. Yellow uh, light usually around magnitude two and the red light threshold where you stop <coughs> somewhere between three and four, usually. Although what the red light means varies from place to place because in some places red light is suspend until authorized to recontinue. Sometimes red is your product's finished. The one that stands out is the UK. When the UK, um, after the 2011 earthquakes near Blackpool and the, the uh, study was undertaken to allow fracking to recontinue in the UK, the thresholds were set at 0 0.0 and 0 0.05, magnitude smaller than the BGS network could actually distinguish at the time. So it was a very difficult thing uh, to fulfill. And then when it be the fracking re-began, a few years ago in Lancashire at a different location, it was in the news every couple of days. And it was in the news because they kept passing the red light threshold. So you'd have BBC headline, energy firm Quadrilla said it hauled fracking for less than for 18 hours after a tremor of 0.8 magnitude. If a 0.8 magnitude earthquake happened underneath this lecture theatre now, none of us would feel it. So if this traffic light was meant to make people safe, I think it had the opposite effect because it made the public think that a 0.5 earthquake was something of consequence which it's not. <clears throat> so that raises the question, what should the threshold be? What, what's the magnitude we're trying to avoid? What's the smallest magnitude that can cause damage in an earthquake? One way we've tried to address this is to take a global database of earthquakes in the range four to five and a half, for which there have been reports of damage. These are not induced earthquakes, but using natural earthquakes here as a surrogate. So if, people have, if there's any report that says there was damage, economic loss or injury, we included it in our database. However, if you want to analyze it, I think the most reliable tool is uh, deaths because the descriptions of damage vary considerably, are quite subjective. Whether someone died or not is obviously much less ambiguous. Uh, we excluded heart attacks because there's interesting research that shows that earthquakes actually cluster rather than cause heart attacks. That's a whole other discussion. It's in the appendix of that paper. But here's the data of numbers of people killed in, in earthquakes by magnitude. And you can see there are very few cases below magnitude four with anything more than a single casualty. And they're all either related to mining or landslides. And in many cases, the mining event, the mining collapse, actually would have been the earthquake. It would have been recorded and registered as an earthquake. And we know that landslides can occur even without earthquakes. So what we concluded from this global review was that for earthquakes smaller than 4.5, significant damage is highly unusual, except in those cases where you have extremely vulnerable exposure. You have to have buildings that are very, very fragile. Otherwise, we really don't see uh, very many cases of anything that you could call structural damage happening with smaller earthquakes. Another body of data that's been looked at is the behavior of dams in earthquakes. So this chart shows us uh, magnitude of earthquake against distance where the dam was located, 
the, um, the open symbols mean there was either no damage or the green is re uh, minor damage. The solid symbols mean there was some more significant damage. And you can see the only ones which are between above magnitude, even above magnitude five, a hydraulic fill structure, extremely vulnerable, masonry and the tailings dams and tailings dams are notoriously unstable. So on this basis, again, you, I think you could put, draw a line at 4.5 and say this is really a reasonable threshold for the possibility of damage. When we pointed that out, someone alerted us to this case history of the Sharadush Dam in Albania, which failed following a magnitude 4.1 earthquake in 2009. There's the dam after its failure. The entire thing uh, was beginning to collapse. It didn't breach the dam, but it was in an effectively failed state. But I spoke at length with the engineers who had worked on that dam for many years. Um, it was raised a few years before the earthquakes with no terracing on the existing face. They just built another layer on top of it. So they, they, they built in the slip surface on which the dam could fail. They also created incompatible drains, which was sucking out effectively all the fill material was being washed out. So there were sinkholes appearing on the surface and the dam was actually collapsing anyhow. It didn't, it would have collapsed, if the earthquake hadn't occurred, it would have occurred in the next, it would have collapsed probably in the next rainy season anyhow. So again, it reinforces the idea, 4.5 is a reasonable limit unless you have extreme fragility. We've looked at liquefaction cases as well uh, with Russell Green, sorry, from Virginia Tech. We concluded that for any ground good enough to have buildings on it, magnitude five seems to be the limit at which liquefaction occurs. There are cases of magnitude four point, almost down to 4.5, but they always occur on marshland or riverbanks where you couldn't construct. But again, 4.5. So. All these observations from tectonic earthquakes would tell us that 4.5 is really the earthquake magnitude at which we need to become concerned, potentially, from a damage perspective, unless you have extremely vulnerable uh, exposure. But then the question comes up, but since induced earthquakes are often much shallower than these natural earthquakes, don't they produce stronger ground motions at the surface? And the evidence suggests not. There's work by Susan Huff from the USGS. She compared induced and natural earthquakes in Central and East United States and found that in the epicentral area, the intensities they produced were effectively the same because the shorter travel path of the shallow induced earthquakes is offset by those earthquakes having also lower stress drop. You've got weaker crust, it's less it's lower confining pressures, and the earthquakes produce uh, lower stress drops. And Gail Atkinson has also published studies both of intensity and recordings and concluded for moderate earthquakes in the same range we looked at, induced and natural events have similar intensities <clears throat> and thus equivalent damage potential at distances close to the epicenter. So we can use natural earthquakes as a surrogate for looking into the potential for damage from small earthquakes. And to reinforce this idea of the 4.5, some small to moderate magnitude earthquakes do, however, induce, produce high amplitude motions. We know that. So do some small natural earthquakes. In that geothermal project in El Salvador, where we did the first traffic light, when that 4.4 event happened, it produced accelerations close to 0.8 G. But even with the extremely vulnerable building stock that was in that village where that motion was recorded, there was no damage. And the thing is that PG, high PGA by itself isn't going to be the cause of damage. We give a lot of attention to PGA. It's a rather poor indicator of what structures uh, earthquakes can do in terms of damage. What really controls damage to a large extent is how much energy there is in the motion. And the energy at the epicenter uh, is largely controlled by the earthquake magnitude. And in fact, it's because PGA, large PGA values can come from small earthquakes with, no, with very low energy is that why we impose a minimum magnitude um, when we're doing PSHA. So if we look at magnitude and energy, what I've done here is plot the seismic energy relative to that in a 4.5 earthquake. So you can see when you get up to a magnitude 6, it's about 1,000 times more energetic. A magnitude 7 is over 5,000 times more energetic. In fact, a magnitude 6 is more like 200, so I'm reading my axis wrong there. But I want to focus in on this part, 2 to 4.6, the small magnitude, which looks like a flat line there. It's not. That's what it really looks like. So, and I want to show you where the case histories I'm about to talk you through in the last 10, 15 minutes, where they are located. The Castor earthquake is the largest one. That's in Spain, magnitude 4.2. It's about 25% of a magnitude 4, which is our 4.5, which is our threshold. UK fracking earthquake was down there, 
uh, the Basel geothermal earthquake 3.2, and Groningen uh, magnitude 3.5 in moment magnitude. You could no notice Groningen in particular, it's less than 5% of the energy of a magnitude that I would consider potentially threatening to normal buildings of non-exceptional non fragility. Let's go to the Castor case very quickly. It was a project to create gas storage offshore Spain in a disused oil field. Um, the gas injection into the reservoir began in the middle of 2013, and in September and October of that year, a series of earthquakes occurred, the largest of which was magnitude 4.2. The project was suspended when that happened. Um, the Geological Survey of Spain, the, or the National Geographic Institute, which is the official seismological service, they published intensity maps which showed that the largest intensity that caused, because it's 20 kilometers from the coast, the largest intensity on the coast was intensity three, which is felt by a few people indoors, people at rest, and no damage. That's actually the minimum level of perceptibility of ground shaking. And yet there were claims for huge amounts of compensation for damage, of which an image has never been shown. Um, but the two directors of the project were eventually put on trial with charges that made them responsible for what happened and what could have happened. Um, if they had been found guilty, they would have gone to prison for seven years for trying to provide gas storage for their country, which needs it. We all need gas storage right now, as you know very well. Um, I was expert witness in the trial, and I'm very happy to say that a few weeks after the trial in November, all charges were dismissed. But the gas field still closed, and they got no compensation, and the gas they did inject is just sat there. But let's go back to what happened. The reason it became a big issue is because shortly after the event, or about a year in the end, when it was finally became public, an, earth, uh, an unpublished report, it was never published in the journal, but a group of academics published a report saying that it occurred on this fault, the Amposta fault, and that that fault was capable of producing a 6.8. And had they continued, there'd have been a 6.8 earthquake 20 kilometers from the shore would have caused havoc. Okay, that fault's completely fictitious, and it got into a database, it was subsequently corrected to that, it's still exaggerated in its overall dimensions, but that is the, the 6.8 magnitude earthquake was based on very limited offshore data that was actually misinterpreted. Um, all the published papers, of which there's now 10 or 12, on the Castor sequence have all concluded the earthquakes occurred on small earthquakes beneath the reservoir, and none of them have they all state categorically it didn't happen on the Amposta Fault. The Amposta Fault's actually a shallow listric structure. It bounds the reservoir, and it's probably associated with salt tectonics. It's probably not a seismic fault at all. But, and in fact, this is so that in the trial, this is the, I was leaving the hotel to go to stand as a witness, reporting on the previous day when the authors of that report had been in court, and the headline said, experts discount the Amposta Fault that's the cause of the earthquake. So people who'd published a report which caused all of this trouble and got the project closed down and these guys put on trial, when they went in court, said, no, it probably wasn't that fault after all. Okay, another project, the Basel Deep Heats Mining Project, is a project in Switzerland, which was, no one would dispute this is green energy, to provide electricity to 10,000 homes, but it was put right in the middle of the city because to be viable, it also had to provide district heating to about 2,700 homes. It's in this part of Switzerland. It was drilling and injecting water at about four and a half kilometers, and that's a picture of the drilling rig in the middle of the city. In December 2006, an earthquake of 2.6 occurred. That triggered their red light. They stopped uh, pumping. I think they even began to pump backwards, but they got one of these trailing events, magnitude 3.4, 3.2, depending on the scale, and it's right here on the boundary of three countries. It was felt by many people. The recorded motions were not wild, 0.1 G, PGA, a couple of centimeters per second PGV. This is not hugely onerous levels of motion. But the shaking resulted in $9 million of insurance claims for damage to the buildings, which were paid out without on-site inspection. The decision was taken not to go and look at the damage because it would create controversy and potential conflict. And this is the kind of damage. I, because we're running out of time, I have to show you what you're looking at. These are the cracks. I bet any of you could go home and find cracks like this in your homes this evening. And the best claim was this one for a piece of timber split uh, by drying. <laughs> Three years after this, 
The project had been run by an engineer called Marcus Herring. He, he did it on behalf. The project was owned by the city of Basel, but he was the project leader on their behalf. They kind of threw him under the bus, and he went on trial for having caused these earthquakes, charged under Swiss laws that forbid the deliberate causing of landslides and floods. So the claim was that his drilling caused underground landslides and floods. Needless to say, within a couple of hours, the judge dismissed the case, and the prosecutor who brought the case went straight into retirement. But again, no compensation, the project's dead. And in fact, the project was killed completely because a study was commissioned to work out the future risk of continuing. And what they did is work out what's the largest magnitude that might have happened, reasonable. But they estimated the impact of that potential, of the hypothetical earthquake, extrapolating from the insurance claims as the measure of damage. And of course came up with numbers which were astronomical and were viewed as unacceptable. Really interesting insight to Basel came a few years later when another um, geothermal project, very similar technology in a place called St. Garland, occurred here, uh, triggered its own earthquake of roughly the same size. Okay? Very similar scenario. So you had similar magnitude, similar depth, and you got similar ground motions. So the Basel motion recorded PGVs are in black and the St. Garland in red. In all senses, comparable. And yet there was absolutely not a single report of damage in St. Garland which really raises questions about why there was so much controversy about the Basel case. Okay, two more, oh no, that brings me to my last case history. The Groningen Gasfield in the Netherlands. There it is, in the very north of the Netherlands. It was discovered in 1959. At the time, it was the seven largest gas field in the world. It's still by far the biggest gas field in Europe. It's operated by a company called NAM. It's a joint venture of Shell and ExxonMobil. And the gas is here in a sandstone reservoir at about three kilometers depth. And that reservoir is offset in various places by ancient faults, which haven't moved for hundreds of thousands of years. And what's happening, this is not a very accurate diagram, but what's happening is it's the two side, the reservoir compresses where it's dis, uh, offset. It, it's actually reactivated these faults causing um, small earthquakes. Here we have a timeline. And this is how much the reservoir was being compacted by the gas extraction. Here you've got the magnitude of the earthquakes. The first earthquake happened in 1991. There was an earthquake in 2006 of magnitude 3.4, 3.5. Let's go with the 3.5. And then six years later, an earthquake of magnitude 3.6. So very similar, the first and second event. The first event was in the newspapers. There were a couple of hundred, I think 400 claims for damage, about three quarters of which were paid carry on, business as usual. When the 3.6 earthquake happened, a uh, huge storm uh, was unleashed. So was the housing, the housing earthquake is referred to as the game changer. These are the strongest motions recorded in the housing earthquake. Uh, it's got 0 0.08 G, 10 times smaller than that acceleration in El Salvador, and a duration, strong motion duration of about half a second. Maximum intensity was reported at six, self-reported by online questionnaire. So it's a bias sample, but even if we take it at space value, what does intensity six means? It's the actual threshold for where damage occurs. And for the kind of buildings we find in Northern Europe, it's really damage of grade one, which is the kind of hairline cracks that we've just seen from the case in Basel. What the field operator did, their response to the housing of earthquake was to start investing in a colossal campaign of data collection and modeling. Something that's on a scale that's never been seen. So there's measurements of the displacement, uh, through GPS, INSAR, and level leveling on top of the production and pressure measurements, which were routine anyhow. Cores were taken from the reservoir, so three kilometer deep boreholes recovered cores from the faults, which were taken to laboratories in uh, the Netherlands for static testing and to Japan for dynamic testing to work out the strength of these faults. They installed 80 new accelerograph instruments together with 200 meter in, uh, instrumented boreholes, which have generated a host of ground motion records that we've been analyzing. And finally, the, for the fragility, they built several full scale houses in laboratories in Portugal and Italy. They took bricks, cement and builders from the region to those, to those locations, built the houses on the shake table using local techniques and tested them under dynamic loads. A, a, an incredible uh, research project in itself. 
The idea was to build a full model that would go from projected gas production, the compaction it occurs, the earthquakes this would occur, the ground shaking, including site response, and then to look at the building exposure, the strength of the buildings, and come up with risk. So risk studies were done and compared with the risk um, guidelines in the Netherlands and where it was found that they wouldn't uh, they violate. The real value of the model was not just to calculate the risk, but to be able to model how you could mitigate the risk. So looking at an, even a simple example of changing production plans, two options, reducing production or upgrading the building, you could look at the relative impact of those different strategies. So what would be the optimal, and Dave, Damien Grant, who's here, worked a lot on the strengthening part of this uh, planning, uh, you, how much could you mitigate the risk by strengthening some buildings? How much could you mitigate by reducing production? How well, what would be the optimal combination of the two? However, that, although that was really a possibility to model and to implement, it never really happened because the regulator response was quite different. The regulatory response, six months after the earthquake, was to publish a report entitled Reassessment of the Probability of Higher Magnitude Earthquakes in the Groningen Gas Field. One thing they said that larger earthquakes might occur, which was an accepted view, the report made its own claim that the earthquakes, the size of the earthquakes is related to the rate of gas production, not to the total compaction, but to the rate at which you cause the compaction. It's actually unfounded, um, hasn't been supported. This is the gas production up to last year. This is the earthquakes up to last year. That's the magic 12 BCM. We've been below it for two years. Earthquakes are still carrying on. So the regulator issued its own science, and it didn't turn out not to be very good science. But the regulators seem to have been decided from the outset that the only solution to the seismicity was not to mitigate the risk, but to shut the field down. Another case of um, claims is the total insurance. These are not insurance claims. These are claims to NAM for compensation. NAM no longer is allowed to handle those claims. They're handled by other bodies representing the government. But that's when the earthquake happened in Housinga. There was a jump, a few hundred more claims, as you'd expect. But when the report by the regulator was proposed, then subsequently the response to any earthquake, even though the earthquakes were smaller, was significantly amplified. And this has just gained, gained uh, momentum as things have gone forward. At one point, the government said it's not sufficient to compensate the damage. If you've damaged the house, you also have to enhance it with an energy efficient measure. Basically what that meant was you had to also put, the NAM had to put a solar panel on the house. When that decision was made, the rate of claims went up drastically. When NAM eventually said, persuaded the government this was unfair and had that policy reduced, it went straight back to where it had been before. The new policy of awarding uh, damage claims is now going off exponentially. But the story's ending with the decision by the government, Dutch government, to close the field. As of the end of the current gas year, the intention is to close, the, the production has been ramped right down, and in October 22, after the summer, it will close down. Has huge consequences. Number one, it's a massive loss of income for the Dutch state. 90% of the income goes as tax to the Dutch state. Over the production life of the field, it's estimated that the state has made one trillion euros from the gas production in Groningen. Number two, Groningen gas is low calorific. It's 14% nitrogen. So if you bring night gas in from somewhere else, you buy high quality gas, you have to convert it by mixing it with nitrogen. You have to convert it into bad gas before it will burn in the network that's calibrated to Groningen style gas throughout the Netherlands and neighboring countries. The, the nitrogen mixing plant, which is being built by another company, is actually behind schedule, which might stop the field being closed quite as early as originally planned. And this is also important because some people, some environmentalists are very happy that the field's been closed down, but that's somewhat myopic. The imported gas, because of where it's being produced, how it's being transported, and the nitrogen mixing will have a significantly higher carbon footprint than carrying on using the Groningen gas. There is no plan in the short term to replace this gas consumption in the Netherlands with renewables. That would be a colossal project which could not be implemented on this time scale. And lastly, the imported gas is going to come from Russia. Um, at a time when Western Europe wishes to become independent of Russian hydrocarbons, and actually for this very reason, not only in the Netherlands, but in Europe, um, the question, the decision to close the Groningen field is being debated quite uh, energetically. And I was reminded of a cartoon which once appeared in 
private eye, claiming that unlike America, EU foreign policy isn't all about oil, it's all about gas. So I think in, the in Groningen field, we really lost a big opportunity. The decision to close the Groningen gas field due to these small earthquakes, which pose a small risk that could easily be mitigated at the expense of the gas company, is really difficult to rationalize, especially in my paper submitted at the end of January. It, I talked about Russian troops on the borders of Ukraine. Obviously, we know what an ugly situation that's developed into and the implications that has. It was also an opportunity, however, that we could have implemented the shack process for the first time we would have applied shack both to risk rather than just hazard and also to induce seismicity. And it could have served as a case history to demonstrate the rational management of induced seismicity. Instead, I think we've had a festival of irrationality. And what's very strange is in a paper published just this year by the staff of the regulator, they make this statement. Extensive gathering of subsurface data and adequate seismic monitoring are therefore essential to allow sustainable use of the Dutch subsurface now and over the decades to come. But NAM spent 200 million euros. It would make any academic weep to get a research budget like that. And over 100 journal papers have been published from that research. If that doesn't buy you sustainable use of the field and rational management of induced seismicity, what hope does any other venture have anywhere? I'm, I'm troubled. Okay, so two courses, it's time to end. I should offer you dessert. However, I don't think there's any way to sweeten that. So I'm gonna offer you some strong coffee instead. I think, and this very simplified my last slide, things I think we need to do, which I discuss at more length in the paper. The energy debate. This is all about energy and it's all very confused. The energy debate is, needs to be informed, objective, honest, and constructive. It's none of those currently. Peer-reviewed science. Peer review in journals is a very imperfect process. We all know that, but it does work and it, there's always a right to respond. Hazard and risk assessments for induced earthquakes should be subject to peer review. I've given you several cases of trouble being caused by uncontested reports being issued without going through any kind of peer review or technical challenges. And we need to publish research that's balanced, acknowledges and, dem and, and includes uncertainty and avoids at all costs sensationalism. And unfortunately, we've seen cases of both academics and regulators doing the opposite. Risk management, we need to give due consideration to all the factors. I'm not trying to simplify the debate about some of these technologies. And all stakeholders need to be learned. But the starting point when we're talking about the risk must be objective assessment of the physical risk imposed by potential induced earthquakes including taking account of what we could do through traffic light systems or through structural strengthening and other measures to do to mitigate the potential risk. And finally, I think it comes down to regulation. The responsibility about whether these projects proceed must ultimately lie with the regulatory body, but the regulatory body needs to provide clear operators to guidelines regarding the requirements in terms of risk. What are the risk targets, not telling, making declarations about what the science is, but telling, setting the risk targets that the operators should then follow, and they need to be technically qualified to evaluate the operator uh, submissions. And I think in induced seismicity, we could learn a lot from the nuclear world where regulation has been very effective and very strong for several decades. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Julian. Now I would like to invite uh, Professor Ahmed El Kazuli to propose the vote of thanks. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a real pleasure and privilege to be asked to propose a vote of thanks for the 17th Mallet Mill lecture delivered by Professor Julian Bomber. I was thinking about this, and I actually known Julian now for over 30 years. Uh, so, as you would expect, I was delighted when I, uh, Stavrul asked me to give this vote of thanks, and I was really looking forward to it. So, and then Julian, I think, 
found out and started getting worried about it, and he sent me an email saying you have to be brief and serious. So I'll, I, <laughs> I'll, I'll try my best. But uh, so very briefly and seriously, I think we've seen a truly fascinating lecture this evening. Uh, Julian has shared with us his reflections on 35 years of experience in the field of seismic hazard assessment, both as a researcher and as a practitioner. The lecture highlighted some of his fundamental contributions that have really helped bridge the disciplines of earth sciences and earthquake engineering. One of these influential contributions is clearly the improvement uh, and characterization of uncertainty in seismic hazard analysis for critical infrastructure. Julian has also emphasized the importance of applying traditional earthquake engineering to the mitigation of induced seismic risk, rather than focusing exclusively on the limited number and size of induced events. So we heard in the lecture today what we know that engineering seismology is a lot about treatment of uncertainties. For us as structural and geotechnical engineers, of course we have to rely on the expertise of brilliant engineering seismologists like Julian. And we have to uh, rely on them giving us advice and input uh, for uh, our seismic design. And it's, it's clearly the case that there is no replacement for experience in this, and Julian has demonstrated this uh, very well. Personally, I have learned a lot from uh, Julian's work on engineering seismology, and again, learned a lot more from the lecture today. I've also been very fortunate to have had direct insights from Julian, for free, before he became a consultant, I say, through <laughs> probably hundreds of discussions over lunch at Imperial College. Julian pointed out in his lecture and his written paper how the practice of seismic hazard and risk analysis had advanced enormously in recent decades, uh, particularly with regards to the amount and quality of data. And this actually reminds me of a memory I have from 30 years ago or so of a young Julian Bomber sitting in a small room, I think it was four to five, and now the Skempton building, sitting with the clicker for hours digitizing earthquake strong motion and then filtering them. So he's really had to start the very hard way. I think we have it easy now. Uh, I think also what Julian has mentioned very clearly is the importance of teamwork and fieldwork, actually, and I think this is also quite obvious in the, in the written paper. And again, it's important to emphasize that despite the ever-increasing advances in remote technologies and computer simulation and experimental method, there is still an enormous value in fieldwork, and I think Julian has shown some examples of this. I benefit personally a lot individually from going on field missions. Uh, some of them have been with Julian probably 30 years ago. I actually remember that we went on, well, we can call it an earthquake field mission, but that was in Shropshire about 30 years ago. Uh, we visited uh, Shropshire and Wrexham. I think we went all the way just to see a couple of uh, damaged chimneys, but it was quite fun, especially with Julian's driving. <laughs> quite interesting. But remarkably, I know that a similar earthquake occurred last week, actually, probably in uh, celebration of your Mellet Milne lecture, Julian. As we've all seen ourselves this evening, Julian is not only a distinguished authority and a renowned scholar in the field of engineering seismology, but he is also truly an exceptional communicator, and I've known that for many years. I'm sure all his collaborators, colleagues, and former students would agree with me on this. And it's really important to note that his publications are not only technically rigorous, but they are also quite comprehensible and practically relevant. I think Julian is quite talented in making very complex uh, topics quite simple uh, to put, uh, put across and disseminate. So it's not at all surprising that his publications are widely used and very well cited. His communication skills also extend to languages. I'm sure many of you would know that. The languages I am just aware of are Spanish, Portuguese, Polish, and even quite a bit of Arabic. Uh, 
what I note also from the lecture today, that his English is still okay, <laughs> despite the efforts of many friends like me. Uh, but I, I would, if you haven't really done so, I would urge you to read the, the written paper. It is absolutely fantastic. Uh, in my view, it provides a state of the art of in seismic hazard analysis for critical infrastructure uh, in a very methodical and insightful manner, and I'm sure it will be a valuable resource for many years to come. So, as I promised, I'll be brief, and I would just conclude by saying that on behalf of SECED, the sponsors of this event, and all of us, please join me in showing our appreciation and thanks to Julian Bomber for this excellent Melanin Lecture.